Matthew chapter uh, 25. You know, growing up, the title of this morning's message is just being a good steward. And uh, growing up, instead of chores, my dad called them stewardships. Maybe you did in your family. But as a kid, I remember telling friends, hey, I got to go home and do my stewardships. And they said, what? What's that, like a chip brand or something? What's stewardships? I said, I don't know. That's just what my dad calls them. Yeah, so, so I called. I said, I guess they're like tours. They feel like tours. <laughs> it's the same thing. But as I began to get older, I began to understand what it is. There is a difference between a stewardship and a chore. A chore is work to equal pay. It's something you have to do. A stewardship is something that's been entrusted for you to manage, to care, to do. You see, one has the goal in mind of just the, maybe the, the money or the work. The other catches the heart. And I didn't understand it until a little later uh, what my dad and, and why he called them stewardships because ultimately he was looking for the heart in the midst of the work to be done. Uh, to get to the heart. It wasn't just about the money. It was about a molding process. And so at times it was, hey, why don't you come and help this person out or come and do this thing over here or come down to the church and paint and there's no money involved. It was just the molding process something entrusted to you. Why? So that years later down the road, having my own family, that those same principles, those same work ethics, that it doesn't always about the money, it's about the molding of God in our heart, um, what he would have us to do. When we realize that God has entrusted you and I with things like a steward to manage, to care, to do, and so... In this parable that Jesus gives, it's the parable of the talents. It has to do with stewardship, of what the master entrusts into the servants and being a good steward. So what I want to do is to kind of give you the big picture of stewardship, that in principle of what it's about, and then to narrow it down to practical, four areas that are real practical for us in our day in society, uh, in being a good steward before the Lord, because I think all of us desire that. And so Jesus says in Matthew 25, starting in verse 14, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Now, Jesus' hearers are very familiar with this because it's not uncommon. It'd be like you heading out for vacation and you want to set your household in order before you're going to be gone for the next two weeks, month, or whatever. Um, And so that's what this man is doing. Verse 15, And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. He left right away as if he's not going to sit around and micromanage them. He's not going to wait to see how they're going to handle it at first for the first two weeks that they're on probation. It's as if he just fully trusts them. So I'm giving you this, this money And that's what a talent was. A talent was a unit of money. It actually was an approximately about 75 pounds worth. And so when you think about somebody just going up to you and say, I'm going to give you a talent. Ka-chong, here you go. Be faithful with it. One talent uh, was the equivalent of, in our day, about $600,000. And so this master was very incredibly wealthy. Think about the guy with five talents. He's a multi-millionaire in a sense, but it's not his. He's simply using it. And so he entrusts these servants with this money and the talent, but the talent could also be figuratively anything that has been entrusted to us. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to give you a little slide of about uh, nine things within the Word of God. Uh, well, that's one of them, as we're talking about. There is money, obviously, that has been given us time. Ephesians 5.16 says, redeem the time or buy up the amount of time you have. Every one of us has a limited amount of time. It says, redeem the time for the days are evil. The gospel is one of those things we need to be a good steward of. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.17, Paul writes, it has been entrusted to me like a stewardship. Uh, the mysteries of God, 1 Corinthians 4.1. Paul reiterates the same thing. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. An amazing thing to consider. Uh, the earth is given to us as a stewardship. It's not ours. It's the Lord's. He created it. He put man on it. And he tells us to, to keep it. Uh, God's will, uh, Matthew, uh, I think it's not 28. Maybe it was 25 or so. But doing the master's will is a stewardship. What his desires are. Uh, the next one was the ministry 
Colossians 1.25, God has given you a ministry as a steward of it. Uh, you don't own it. It's, you're simply the tool, and it's God's ministry. Uh, the eighth one is spiritual gifts, as you see them recorded there in Romans, Corinthians, and Ephesians, uh, that God distributes them to each one individually as he wills, and he expects us to use those gifts for the glory of his name uh, to promote his kingdom. The ninth one uh, is natural learned skills could be considered a talent as well. God has gifted some of you with some incredible abilities, and whether you have learned it by a trade or whether it was given to you as a natural skill, uh, recognize that they come from God. Uh, they come from God. And so God has entrusted us with a whole bunch of things to be good stewards of. And we need to do it with all our heart as to the Lord because there's where our reward comes from. And that's what the, the, the master did to these servants here. Verse 15, you notice, he gave them out to each according to his own ability. And we recognize that God knows how much you and I can handle. He gives them out according to his understanding, not ours. His will, not ours. And what he entrusts to you, listen, it isn't a reflection of how much he loves you or not. You'll hear it today, every once in a while. Oh, God really loves me. That's why I got a lot. You know, God doesn't love me. That's why I don't have anything. No, 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 no. What God has entrusted to you is not a matter of his love. He can't love you any more, love you any less. It's just those who might have more, well, they're responsible for more and accountable for more. Yeah. Think about it in that respect. And sometimes we would go, wow, thank God I don't have more. <laughs> thank God I'm not in that guy's position. <laughs> Look what he's got to deal with. But that's what we're accountable. So we realize this, that everyone has at least one talent, one measure, one, something that's been entrusted to them. And don't despise the one to think that, oh, it's just no big deal. Hey, so I'm wiping noses and, and, you know, big deal. No, no, no. You wipe noses for the glory of God. And you do it as unto him. Don't despise it because God looks at it, as we see in this parable, incredible potential for his glory in ways that we can't see. So don't despise it. But number two, don't get jealous of the person who might have five or might have two. Well, why, Lord? Why do they get more than me? They just trust the Lord. Be faithful with what he's put into your hands. In fact, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2, it says it is required in a servant that one be found faithful. That God is looking for the character more than what he's committed into your hand. He's looking for the character within the vessel. Look at Luke 16. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. Jesus says, if then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, which is the money, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another's, who will give you that which is your own? A.K.A., if you can't be faithful in what God's already put into your hands, why would he entrust you with more? It would ruin you. We need to backtrack and rethink about that. You see, when we get our eyes off of the Lord and we start getting them onto others or ourselves, three things happen. Number one, I start to get jealous in some measure, I start to get bitter because life isn't giving me those set of cards or I simply get distracted from what God really wants to do in my life. Well, there was John and Peter. In John chapter 20, Jesus restores Peter. He says, come take a walk with me. He says, Pete, by the way, here's what's going to happen in your life. You're going to be crucified, basically, is what he's telling him. And what does Peter do? You remember? Peter turns to the Lord and says what? Well, what about him? Pointing to John. I'm sure Jesus just shakes his head and goes, Oh, Peter, what I want to do with him is none of your concern. You follow me. And that's, I think, good for all of us to remember. I don't want to get jealous. I don't want to get bitter. I don't want to get distracted. Lord, what do you have for me? And that's what I want to do. And I want to be faithful to it because faithfulness is the mark of success in God's eyes. Faithfulness. That's what you have to remember. Verse 16, he says, Then he had... He who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another uh, five talents. And likewise, he who had received two, two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. So the two stewards invested the money. They traded on the Jerusalem stock market thing or the Wailing Wall Street or whatever it was at the time, or whatever they're using. They traded and they made, they made some gain. Uh, actually, 100% gain. 
Well, the one decided that, hey, I'm just going to go bury it and hide it. And we really see as it unfolds that this was done out of fear and selfishness. Verse 19, and after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And he also had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. As the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many uh, things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. We stop right there for a moment. You'll note three things with me. That one, there is a day of accountability, a day of reckoning in verse 19. It had been a long time, but the day truly came where the stewards would have to be accountable to the master for what he had entrusted to them. There was no excuses. There was no a sick call in type of thing. There was no, hey, sorry, can't make it. Can we do this tomorrow? It was a day of reckoning. At number two, you might note that the accountability was on an individual basis. No one could say we, only I on that day. And truly it's the same on the day that we stand before a God. We can't say we, there is only I. What have I done with what you have entrusted to me? And then the third thing is that the settlement was given in the, according to the amount that was entrusted to them personally. What I mean by that is that the guy with five was accountable only for his five, not for the guy with two and vice versa. There wasn't expectation from the guy with two that, 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 well, how come you didn't take more from this guy over here? And, and so it was personal, it was individual in these things. Each of us, there is coming a day when we must give account before the Lord for our actions, for our lives. The Bible makes it very clear. To whom much is given, much is required. Think about these verses. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Yes, there is uh, an accountability, accountability day for all of us, but each one. And then in Romans 14, 12, so then each, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Knowing this day is coming, the question remains, how does it change me now? It should make me busy about the Father's business. It should make me serious about uh, what he has entrusted to me that I might be a faithful servant. So the five talents turned to ten, the two turned to four, and both received the same commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. It was a commendation of praise. The master says, well done. You're good and faithful servant. You're faithful. In other words, the master was more concerned about the character within the servant than he was about the bottom line prophet. He says, you're just faithful in these things. And by the way, the guy with the five and the guy with the two, it says you were faithful in a few things. In light of the big picture, no matter how much we have here or God has put into our hands, it's still smidgens. It's a few Few compared to the richness of the master. So there was praise in there. There was a promotion. You've been faithful over a few. I'm going to make you ruler over many. And promotion comes from the Lord. It's not man-made. It's not my will or abilities. It's not what I have done. It really is what the Lord desires to do. So there's praise, there's promotion, and there's the promise. Enter into the joy of your Lord, the delight of your Lord. And truly the delight for any believer is that in heaven and seeing Jesus face to face, and carrying out his will for all eternity. It really is going to be the best of the best. So the two were faithful, but listen, one was fearful. Let's look at his story in verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent, he came on this day, basically, and he said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore take what the talent 
or take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The servant knew what his master was like. He says there in, in, in verse 24, that I knew you to be a hard man, reaping what you didn't sow. That you're a wise investor, you're a powerful man. I know that about you, and the master doesn't deny it. But the servant's uh, actions here tell us his fear. That he was afraid in verse 25. I was afraid, afraid of loss, afraid of the risk, afraid of whatever it might be. Fear had gripped his heart. And here's the point. He was paralyzed by fear, and so he did nothing. And that's what got him into big trouble. He buried it. He hid it in the mattress, you might say. And he was even convinced in his heart that what he was doing was right. Think about that. He's even convinced, hey, master, you should at least give me a pat on the back that I still got my brain and I remember where I buried it. I don't have old timer's disease and I just forgot everything. Oh, well, somewhere out there is this treasure. You give me a pat on the back for at least I, I know where it is type of mentality. At no point did he ever be, feel guilt and repent and say, you know what, maybe I shouldn't really go get that and try to invest it and do my best for his will. Nothing like that happened. But he was paralyzed with fear. And we realize this, that God has entrusted to you and I a measure, not so that we would just babysit it, and not so that we would just bury it, but that we would use it for his glory, that we would take risks in the kingdom, that we would invest and see his glory and his will promoted. And, and you see, in one sense, that, that's the mentality that we carry into what we call the life groups, is we're looking at the multiplication. We're looking at the advancement. It's not something I hold on to. It's something I want to see expand for the glory of God. God says, hey, I've given you those life groups. Now, what are you going to do with it? Oh, Lord, we're going to, in time, expand it and multiply it so that on that day we could say, Lord, we've been faithful. You see, multiplying requires letting go. Risk requires letting go of what I have for something greater down the road. Anybody know who Kyle McDonald is? Probably not. Well, July of 2005, Kyle McDonald did an experiment. He took a red paper clip and he offered it to trade anybody for it. He'd go to wherever they were at and trade for it. And so what happened, if you can look up his story, he took a red paper clip and he took that paper clip and somebody offered to trade him for a, a, a fish-shaped pen. So he took that fish-shaped pen and then he offered to trade the fish-shaped pen and he traded it for a handcrafted doorknob. Well, he got the handcrafted doorknob and then he then traded it for a uh, an old Coleman camping stove. A year later, he traded a movie roll for a two-bedroom house in Canada. All started from a paperclip. That's a wise investment. So I decided yesterday on Facebook to throw it out. What would you give me for a paperclip? <laughs> it ain't working too good. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. I think the best thing I got was a rock. So we're not getting very far. But multiplying <laughs> requires... <laughs> it requires letting go for the sake of something greater. And that's what this man needed to do, but he didn't. I think it's better to take steps of faith and take risks for the sake of the kingdom of God than to sit back and just bury it because we're afraid. Let's be faithful with the Lord has put into our hands and watch God do amazing things. In fact, maybe there's something even this morning that the Lord is prompting your heart. You need to step out in faith and do what I've already told you to do. Don't say later. Don't say someday. No, no, no. You need to now. Don't sit back and just go, well, it's not a big deal. No, it is a big deal. The master's entrusted you with. It's not a matter of discerning God's will. He's already spoken to you his will. It's a matter of, Lord, get me out of the fear that grips my heart and help me to step forward in faith and to trust you that you're going to be there. It happens to all of us at one time or another. And we need to trust that the Lord is there. So in verse 27, the servant was rebuked for not even doing the least. He says, hey, how come you couldn't take it down to the bank and get me the 0.01% interest? Even that pennies is better than what you're doing. In fact, he even tells him, you are a wicked and lazy servant. 
Wow, that's pretty harsh words. But it revealed the heart of this servant. It was not in alignment with the master. And he says, you're wicked and you're lazy. By the way, laziness is a sin. In fact, when we think about the judgment, the judgment of God is not just given on the basis of the bad things you did. It's given on the neglect of the right things you should have done in this case. He says, you're a wicked and lazy servant. And the master um, gave the one talent to the man with the ten who was faithful And the laziness just simply revealed that he was not a servant at all. And the man was fired, literally, cast out of his presence. Got no letter of recommendation for his next job, I imagine. And that's the end of the parable. What was the point of the parable? Well, in the context, it has to do with the Lord's coming again. And when Jesus comes again, the parable Jesus is making himself is that we need to be faithful with what God has entrusted to us as a good steward of those resources, we need to advance his interests and build his kingdom, and in the end, we will enter into his joy. Now, the reason, uh, one of the reasons why I bring that up is I want to take you from principle to a few practical things. I think there's four arenas uh, that we have to consider when we think about the stewardship of what God has entrusted us with. Four arenas. There is giving, saving, investing, and avoiding debt. And, and uh, Again, if you're new here, you're just visiting, I never talk about money. I I never do. Very rarely will we. But at at certain occasions, I think it's, it's proper. And we have to realize that though in society it has been kind of a taboo for churches to talk about, and it's been so abused and so misrepresented, that reality, it's a biblical thing. And we want to mature in what the Bible has to say about it in our lives. And so when we think about, first of all, that giving, that giving aspect, tithing and offering, tithes and offerings is what it's been called. What's the distinction? What's the difference? Well, a tithe was 10%. That's what it means. It's a 10%. A tithe was given to a church or uh, the tabernacle for the ministry that took place through the church. The offering was that which was outside of the church that, you know, you would have a missionary, you would have an a, uh, orphanage, you would have something outside, you know, the guy on the street or the poor that you would, in, you would care for. And they were separate and, and they were to do both. You couldn't take your tithes that were meant for the church and shift them over to just giving to the poor and you couldn't say, well, I gave to the church so I don't need to take care of this situation. The Lord wanted his people really to do both. But biblically, here's where it stands. Abraham, I think at first, decided from love to give to the high priest Melchizedek in Genesis 14. It was out of his own heart that he gave before the law ever happened and so it was motivated by love. Jacob says, Lord, I'm going to give you a tenth, a tithe of everything that you put into my hands if you'll be with me all the rest of my days in Genesis 28. And then, of course, in the law, it was instituted, Deuteronomy 14, that tithe was to be that act of worship uh, to the Lord. In Proverbs 3, it says this, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So honor the Lord and he'll... Take care of those things. Malachi 3, one of the most severe scriptures, says it's such a serious thing to God that to not do it was like robbing God. Wow. He says, will a man rob God? This is Malachi 3. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? He says, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this. The only time in scripture the Lord says put me to the test. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out on you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. You see, God doesn't need it. God doesn't need it. Ministry's not going to collapse if you don't give. No, he doesn't need it. We need it. In our heart, we need it. Because it frees us up to focus on his kingdom It frees our hearts from the grip of self and moves us into that place of blessing. And some people say, well, you know, that's all Old Testament stuff. Well, if you look at the New Testament, here's what you find. Jesus didn't say stop it. He said do and. Wow, he notched it up. He stepped it up. Look at Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. 
These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. He stepped it up a notch. Paul would take it in talking to the Corinthians and says, listen, it's not a debt. It's not a bill. It's not an obligation out of manipulation. It's strictly an act of worship and the love of God in your heart. This is what he says in 2 Corinthians. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. That means there's no manipulation or pressure. For God loves a cheerful giver, a hilarious giver. That's what it is in the, in the Greek, hilarious. So when you think about your worship, is your heart just laughing? <laughs> and you're giving? And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. You see, it's always been more about a money issue with God. It's the heart issue. It's an act of worship. It's a revelation and a witness to the world that my God is a blesser, not a taker. And his kingdom and being used by him is important in my life. And being a good steward, I have to ask myself, one, am I a giver? And, and I must say this in a church, you guys are incredible givers. Incredible givers. I say, and, and just, I, am, I can't even say enough. Incredibly giving. So why am I getting into this? Because I, I want you to see the, the, the context biblically. But I also want, to, I want you to hear the national average. And this, is, this is kind of scary. Barna did a poll in 2012. He found out that more than half of Americans are givers. More than half, which is clothes and charities, monies, time, volunteering. 79% of evangelicals have given some money over the last year to their churches. 79%. But only 5% of adults qualify as having tithed 10% of their annual income to the church. They break down the figures as this. 22% gave $100 or less. 33% gave between $100 to $500 for the year. 20% donated $500 to $1,000. 12% contributed between $1,000 to $2,500. And 8% offered $2,500 to $5K. And 5% donated over $5,000 for the year. It sums up to this. 55% of the people who gave money in this year that they did this, the who, people who tithe, 55% gave $500 or less in a year. 75% of people were $1,000 or under for any given year. 75%. And again, I'm not harping on money. I want you to understand my heart. It's all about worship. And I sometimes think, and I'm just being open with you as a pastor, and I could probably speak for, for churches all over America. If, if believers simply set aside 5% of their annual income how great an advancement of the gospel could go out in this world. How often the bivocational pastor could be a radical agent in his community to transform it. What would we see socially? What would we see in the family? What would we see, dare I say even politically? What would we see in the community? And so it's something just to kind of keep in the back of my mind. But, but more than that, here's, here's what really in my heart God started pricking me on. Am I teaching my kids? In each of these things, we have to go back and go, am I teaching my kids the principles of giving, saving, uh, investing, and avoiding debt? It's important. Am I teaching the kids? If I'm not exampling it, they're not going to follow it, and they're not going to see the joy in it. Oh, they're too little. No, they're never too little to begin to example a habit that will develop into a knowledge of it and develop the character. I need to set the example. I need to give my, my kids, and we, and we do, duties around the house and have savings, giving, and you know, uh, investing type of things um, for them to see and walk through biblically. Giving. Saving. You realize that saving is being a good steward of what God has given you? Saving is being a good steward. Jesus told a parable of a rich man and he just decided, oh, I want bigger barns. And he does all for self and he hoarded it all and the Lord says, hey, you, you're a fool. And this night your life's required of you. But think about Joseph. Joseph, as we studied in the book of Genesis, Joseph was a saver. Remember, he knew that a famine was coming and he began to save up. Why? It wasn't just for his household. It was for the whole nation. It was for the whole world that would come to receive. There was ministry. 
And so saving is being a good steward. In fact, the Bible tells us, even in Proverbs 6, to go to the ant, you sluggard. Feeling sluggish, consider an ant. Consider her ways and be wise, which have no captain or overseer or ruler. She provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. That she's self-motivated, she's thinking ahead, she's considering the future. And saving is not a lack of faith. In fact, it shows a mature faith. It's not out of fear. You're just hoarding it. You're saving it in maturity that you're governing over those fleshly impulses because you see the bigger picture. I mean, teaching my kids to save. Am I teach, teaching them the importance about those? Am I making goals with my kids, long-term, short-term goals, where, where they're seeing that I can, um, uh, we want to plan this vacation, and so, by the way, we're going to save for it. You see, here's what I realized. Often, what do our children see us do? Swipe. They hardly ever see you pay the bill. And so they get this mentality that it's just all about swiping, swiping, swiping. In fact, my daughter just picked up a game of Monopoly. She likes Monopoly. And there's no paper money anymore. They give you a card. It's really fast and it's really cool. But I'm thinking, oh man, this is dangerous. <laughs> so the other day we went on vacation and I sat my kids down and I said, hey guys, I want you to know something. First and foremost, the reason why we're doing this is because mom has saved. Dad can't save. No, mom, mom has saved for the past year and a half to go on this vacation. So give a big hand for mom. And I wanted them to see the connection that saving is good and then the celebration in it is, is, is good. And so just dangerous to be aware of saving. We need to save. We need to teach our kids what it is to save. The third one was investing. And investing is being a good steward of God's resources. That's exactly what we read about here in the parable. The master was a wise investor. He wanted his stewards to invest for the profit of the master. And we have to consider that as well. The Bible has much to say about that as well. Um, God's dividends outweigh anything. Am I teaching my kids about investing even for the future, for the kingdom of God, and things that I would take on and, and as a family take on support of something that they can give to and they can see God work in? And the last one is, is avoiding debt. And, and the reason why I bring that up is because uh, there are three kinds of people. Three kinds of people in this world, that has been said. The haves, the have-nots, and the have-not paid for what they have. <laughs> That's how it breaks down. But as you know, uh, um, and as we know, that being good steward is also seeking to be uh, avoiding debt, is living within your means, uh, and, and being a good steward of what God's put into your hands. Um, and we have to be really careful. Here's what we're finding out. Uh, we are drowning in debt. Um, this is from debt.com. 160 million Americans have credit cards. I'm one of those 160 million. Uh, the average is three, and the average credit card debt per household is $15,263. Urban Institute report just put this out last week. 33% of us, that is 77 million people, are so far behind on payments, their debts are, quote, in collections. 33%. The average is $5,200. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying, this is the reality. Some of you go, man, mine's worse than that. And, and, but this is where we're at. It, Proverbs tells us in Proverbs 22 that the borrower is a servant to the lender, and this is just the reality that the debt makes me a servant to the owner of the bank. But here's the problem. It so often can begin to rob me of my rest and my joy in the Lord. I start stressing. I start losing sleep. I, I start, you know, doing all things that are unnecessary. It reminds me of a guy. He, he uh, began to get collection calls. And, uh, and the guy kept hounding him. The collection calls kept hounding him. And the man basically said, hey, here's what I do. When I get paid, I put all the names into a hat. And I just draw out. Whichever one I draw out first, he's the guy that gets paid. And he's telling this guy on the phone, if, I just draw him out. And when all the money is gone, all the money's gone. If you don't stop calling me, I'm not even going to put your name in the hat. <laughs> <laughs> it was only that easy, right? <laughs> Proverbs 19.2. Also, it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge. And he sins who hastens with his feet. Boy, take time to pray and seek God. 
We all have those burns from buyer's remorse. Oh, why didn't I think? Why didn't I listen? Why didn't I stop and pray? And some of those things we carry for years and years. But listen, bar- borrowing is, is biblical. It's not a sinful thing. We have to understand that. It's not a sinful thing to borrow. In fact, in many ways, it was a way to help a person in need. A few more scriptures and we'll close. Psalms 112, verse 5, a good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Not everything I'm supposed to jump in. Uh, every request is met. Um, but having discretion. Matthew 5, 42, give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. And of course, the context is of love and being led by the Spirit, but having an open heart. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we teaching our kids how to avoid debt? And being a good steward, let's teach them how to avoid debt. Because when they graduate from college, every credit card company in the world is going to be knocking on their door because they want a piece of the pie. In fact, the average, I found out, the average, when somebody graduates from college, the average student loan debt is $29,400. And 55% of those graduating end up in a full-time job. I just load it. So we need to be careful. Example it for your kids. These principles. Teaching them those principles. Putting it into practice. And avoiding those things. Gang, in the end, you want to hear it. I want to hear it. Well done. Good and faithful servant.